Good evening. Welcome to the Thursday night Bible study. The trip through the Bible continues with the book of John tonight. John was one of the 12 apostles. It is conclusive that he wrote the book of John. And some people, they're, they're always those that try to doubt things and uh, write books and come up with new theories. But John the Apostle is the one that wrote the book of John. And he was one of the four fishermen. Of the 12 apostles, four of them were fishermen in the Sea of Galilee from the north of Israel. And when Jesus told them to come and follow him, they left their businesses, they left their nets, they left their family, they left it all and went and followed Jesus. You'll see later some of them are returning to their fishing. After he uh, died on the cross, uh, they returned to their fishing, but then they pretty much were determined after that, you'll see, to serve God and to, as Peter, as, uh, Peter was told by Jesus, to feed his sheep. So there are so many things in the book of John. I'm going to make this a two-part series. But three key things that we're going to see in the book of John tonight. It's another one of the many Bible books that show that Jesus is God. And that there are different names for Jesus. Such as the I Am. Such as the Word such as Jesus, such as the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. So he has many names. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, Yeshua, Jehovah, uh, many different names. The other thing we're going to see in the book of John is this is the part of God that is not only, and that is Jesus, the Lord, the I Am, the Word, He's the part of God that not only created the heavens and the earth, but he is also the part of God that created all things and that by him all things consist. And that there wasn't anything made that was made that was not made by him. So we're going to see John, uh, that Jesus, the word, the I am is the God creator. I've had people that, and one in particular that doesn't like me saying they're different parts of God. He likes the statement of faith that people have where God is in three persons. Well, Jesus is the express image of God. And God identifies different parts of God. That's why I identify different parts of God, because you'll see in the Bible that there are different distinct parts of God, the Father, the Son, who's the Word, and the Holy Spirit. They're all one, but they are distinct as well. So they're different parts of God. Now, the other thing you're going to see tonight in the book of John is why the water baptism. What is water baptism doing? You'll see it coming out. It's an Old Testament thing, by the way. They had to wash with water in order to get in the Jewish temple, and God warned them that there would be a death penalty possibly levied against them if they did not get washed with water before they went into the, the temple. The whole, and that was applicable to the Levitical, Levitical priesthood. So they had to wash with water or else they were not to go inside the temple. Well, Israel's a nation of priests and kings. They understood water baptism before Christ was ever manifest to Israel. But we're going to see why is the water baptism occurring at the very beginning of the book of John. Why is John the Baptist baptizing with water? And he explains why he's baptizing with water. To manifest Jesus Christ to Israel. That's the reason he's baptizing with water. Manifest Christ to Israel. That's one of the prime, primary reasons for water baptism is to show Israel, here's your Messiah, here's Christ, here's your mighty God, here's the one that you've been waiting for. And that's what John the Baptist's job was, to point the way to God. How can Israel get into this kingdom of God? How can they get resurrected from the dead? 
and enjoy this kingdom that has been promised to them by God through the prophets in the Old Testament scripture. One of those ways that they get into the kingdom is with water baptism. It was a necessity of salvation under the gospel of the kingdom. But the purpose of the water baptism and their identification with it was to manifest Jesus Christ to Israel. So we're going to take a look at that. That's the third thing we're going to look at tonight. John showing, like many other Bible books, that Jesus is God and has many names. The book of John showing also that Jesus is God the creator, the part of God that created. As other Bible books point that out, the heavens, the earth, and all things. And then why is a water baptism coming in? Well, we're going to find a person that was sent to water baptize expressly in addition to the 12. The 12 were sent to baptize. They were sent to Israel initially, not to the Gentiles, but they were sent to baptize. And John the Baptist, we're going to see, was sent by God to baptize. We're going to see why. So please turn to John chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's think about this. In the beginning was the Word. Now, the beginning's not defined here, but whenever it was, the Word was there in the beginning. And we're going to read on how He's the Creator. So maybe it's the beginning of this world or the beginning of this universe, I guess. Whatever it is, there it is right there. In the beginning was the word. So he was there in the beginning. Because of the context, it appears to be the creation, the beginning of the creation. And the word was with God. So he's with God there at the beginning. The word is with God. But he's something else here. And the word was God. He's in the beginning of the creation, presumably. I'm going to presume this is the beginning of the creation of the heavens and the earth and the universe as we know it. He's also with God. So you read in passages like in the book of Genesis where God says, let us... Make man in our image. That's what God says. And we're going to find out the one that said that was the word. And that is another name for the Lord Jesus Christ we're going to find out tonight as well. And the word was with God, but in addition, and the word was God. Conclusively, this proves Jesus is God. How do we prove that Jesus is God. How do we prove that Jesus is the word? Turn down to verse 14 of John chapter 1. There's no mistaking who it is. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There he is. The word was made flesh, the only begotten of the Father. The word that was in the beginning of the creation. The word that was with God in the beginning of the creation. So they're there together, the word and God. And the word that also was God in the beginning. He's all three. In the beginning, he's there creating. We're going to read on and find out he was creating in the beginning with God, and he also is God. And there he is in verse 14, the word was made flesh. So he pre-existed, obviously, his incarnation as the Lord Jesus Christ. He became flesh, called Jesus, called Christ, called the Lord Jesus Christ, many names, but he pre-existed becoming a human. According to Micah 5.2, the one born in Bethlehem has been from everlasting, meaning he's been from eternity past. 
Obviously, he has because he was God and is God and all will always will be God. I think that's something that you got to get a grip on. You got to kind of wrap your arms around. He was called Yeshua when he came in the form of a man. When he was made flesh, he was made into Yeshua. The word God identified in verse 1 was made flesh. That flesh was called Yeshua because he became a man. So the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God dwelling in human form as a human being, Yeshua, Christ, the Lord, Son of God, Son of Man, many other names, Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world is what John the Baptist called him. The I am, we're going to see is called the I am, which is the Lord God of Israel, just like in Exodus, where Moses said, what am I going to tell the children of Israel your name is? And God identified himself, the God of Israel, as I am that I am. We're going to see that as the name of Jesus as well. But the incarnation, meaning he became human, occurred when he was implanted as God Almighty into Mary's womb. The power of the highest overshadowed Mary, as we read and studied, I believe it was last week, or it might have been the Thursday before that. So that's when he was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. The only begotten of the Father, we studied that as well. He was born of a virgin, the only begotten. And he was the firstborn from the dead as well. Begotten meaning born from the dead, according to the book of Colossians. Now, the word is the name of Jesus in other places in the Bible. I'm not going to have you turn there. But in Revelations 19, when he returns to this earth to set up his kingdom with all of his armies, and he's going to return on a white horse. When he came into Jerusalem, he came into Jerusalem when he was made flesh to go and get crucified. And die for your sins. He came on a donkey. And there was a baby donkey there too. So he came into Jerusalem on a donkey. When he returns. He's going to return. On what appears to be. What is a white horse. But an eternal horse. A glorified horse. And his armies are going to come down with him. And they're going to come down those armies and clear out the evil from this earth. But when he comes down, you can look at it for yourself in Revelations chapter 19. He's going to be called the word of God. Yes, he's going to be called the word of God. That's what he is, the word of God. Just like he's eternal life. Just like he's life. In him is life. He's the source of everything. He is the source of everything. The father wanted, the God part of the father wanted the God part of the son to have the preeminence in everything. Even being dying for us and being the firstborn from the dead. Verse 4 of 1 John proclaims, proclaims, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So in him was life, and light as well. So he's life, and the life is the light of men. 
before we leave this topic of the word and the name for Jesus and being God, let's turn over to 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to see how there again Jesus is called the word, and we see how he and the Father are also one. And we're going to see that they're all part of God. The Spirit of God, the Father, and the Word are all one, meaning they're all part of God. They're different parts of God. They manifest themselves in different ways, but they're all God. So why don't we turn over to 1 John and see another reference to the Word. First John chapter 5. And other versions of the Bible don't have the same language as the King James, some of the others, in regard to this. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father. The Word. And the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. People say, the Trinity is not a biblical doctrine. But have they ever read 1 John chapter 5, verse 7? That these three bear record in heaven. The Father, we know that's God the Father. The Word, we know that's God the Son. And the Holy Ghost, we know that's God, the Holy Spirit. And the three of them are one. I mean, I think what it is, other versions of the Bible don't explain it this way. And I know that other versions, there's issues with this passage in 1 John. But that's clear as day. There's no mistaking it. Let's turn back to John chapter 1. So in John chapter 1, let's look at that creator God part of Jesus that John teaches. Verse 3 of chapter 1. Of John 1, uh, John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that, is, that was made. That is so conclusive that he, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that was made was made by him. And there are a lot of other places in the Bible where, where that is a fact. It's a biblical fact. There's no disputing it. A lot of statements of faith say the father made all things and they leave out the son as a creator because they get it from some uh, old statement of faith that went through so-called church fathers and all that. Well, that's not the whole story. Now, the father did create things, but he created it through the son. So to leave out the God, the son's part of creation, it's not biblical. It's not factual. And in some ways, it's really not honest. You're trying to diminish part of God. You should never diminish part of God. The Holy Spirit, the word who is the son or the father. Don't diminish any of those. And I see that a lot in statements of faith. And I'll have to correct those. I'll say, wait a minute. Do you know what part of God created the heavens and the earth? And I get a lot of feet. I get a lot of kind of resistance to that from people. They think that you're making too much about Jesus, which I don't know if they really understand who the Jesus of the Bible is. But let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. So verse 13, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So there he is as 
the son of God, kingdom of his dear son, other name for him. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. So we know who we're talking about. Jesus Christ. Who is the image of the invisible God. He's a part of God that always has appeared to man. He's a part of God that appeared to the children of Israel. The Bible says, in fact, nobody has seen God at any time referring, I believe, to the Father. But the Son has been visible as the, the image of the invisible God. He's the express image of God. I believe it's in Hebrews chapter 1. The firstborn of every creature. Now let's get into the creative aspect. He's the firstborn of every creature. How is the firstborn of every creature? He's the firstborn from the dead, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Why should he be the firstborn from the dead? He became incarnated. He was made flesh, God was, and he should be the firstborn in the dead, from the dead? Yes, because that in all things, he might, may have the preeminence. I want you to think about this. I know I'm getting off topic a bit. But Jesus Christ ascended up after he was, after he died for our sins and was buried and was raised bodily. He ascended up above everything in the highest point of the universe. Above everything, above every name that is named, above every power that exists, above all royalty, above everything. But before he ascended up above everything, he went down into the very heart of the earth. He went to hell. So he went everywhere, literally, down into the depths of the earth. He went to hell. And that great prophecy from the second Psalm, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thy suffer thine holy one, meaning God the Son, that's another name for him, the holy one, neither shall thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So he went in the depths of the earth. Then he went high above everything so that he would have accomplished it all. Why is that so? Why should he have the preeminence so that he, as God, would die and be the firstborn from the dead? Well, it's explained right here in Colossians. It's explained because for verse 19, for it pleased the Father, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, all fullness dwell in him. Not only did he die, not only did he go in the depths of the earth, not only did he ascend above everything, he didn't have to do any of that stuff. Because he's God, he did it for you. But that pleased the Father, that he would be the firstborn from the dead, that he would have the preeminence, that he would experience the resurrection from the dead. But let's go back to him as a creator. Verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Okay, so heaven and earth is created by him, visible and invisible. So everything we could see and everything we can't see, he created it. All the creatures, all the creation. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. See who your savior is? He's not only God, he's creator of everything. He's the creator of all things. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So everything consists by him. Gravity, electrons, neutrons, atoms matter all things consist by him that's why the earth rotates on its axis at a thousand miles per hour um and that the earth goes around the sun apparently at uh 160 000 miles per hour uh or more and the whole solar system goes through space at 400 000 plus miles per hour according to what you read in science all of that consists by Jesus Christ. Now, I wanted to go to John chapter 8. So let's return back to the book of John. 
and go to John chapter 8. And then I want to go to Hebrews about him as a creator as well. But I skipped over John 8, which I wanted to show you how he is God there in John chapter 8 because he is the I am. John 8 at the end of the chapter. So he's getting into it with these religious people in Israel, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're debating with him. They want to kill him. They're jealous of him. Um, and he explained to them, he explains to them that they're basically, they don't know the father. They don't know God. They are of their father, who is the devil, and they're doing the will of their father. And so there's a powerful debate going on between God and the religious people of these religious leaders of Israel who are evil people. And it goes back and forth. Um, so they're telling him, Abraham's our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth which I have heard of God, meaning he heard it from God the Father. This did not Abraham, and watch, because Jesus is going to make himself God, or point out, tell the truth, that he is God, in the same passage. But he is telling them, they're saying, we have Abraham as our father. And Jesus told them, you wouldn't try to kill me if, uh, um, if you if you were if Abraham really was your father and you were following Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. So Abraham believed the truth. You do the deeds of your father, then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? This is what Jesus is telling them. Even because you cannot hear my word. And then he lays it on the line what these religious people were. The leaders, these religious leaders. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. And that is how it is with the world. You tell them the truth, they don't believe it. They follow a liar and they follow lies. So they're following a liar and they're doing the will of the liar. And one of those, the will of the liar is to murder people and to lie. And so he tells them, that's basically what you do. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. So as this continues, this debate, they're accusing uh, him of being demon-possessed. Uh, and that say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. And as it goes on... Um, Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou, thou thyself? Jesus answered, uh, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me. And then he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Now watch this. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He is making himself the Lord God of Israel. He is making himself the Lord. He is showing that he is, because he's telling the truth. He is, he doesn't have to make him that, himself that. I shouldn't use that uh, 
phraseology. He's not making himself God. He is God. And he is the I am of Israel. And therefore, he's telling them the truth and saying, before Abraham was, I am. And they know what that means. So they instantly take up stones to cast at him and to kill him because they consider him to be a blasphemer, making himself into God. And they took up stones to cast at him. So before Abraham was, I am, that's the name of God in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. And Jesus is proclaiming himself to be that God, the I am. And I want to say another thing that um, as far as him being God, there's another thing in the book of John that we need to look at. And that is in John chapter, um, in John chapter, I think it's the very end of the book of John, where Thomas, and let's take a look back there. Let me see if I can find it. Look at the end of the book of John and find it. I think it's this, the last chapter of the book of John. And so these. It might be the second to last chapter. It's, it's where um, Thomas is refusing to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Even though, uh, even though they, you know, the witnesses appeared onto them and said he was. So I think it might be the second to last chapter of the book of John. Yeah, so here it is. So John chapter 19, or I'm sorry, John chapter 20. So Jesus appears on them. They're shut in. They are shut in. The doors are closed. So they're closed in there in verse 19. Then the same day at eve evening, being the same day of the week, when the doors were shut, <clears throat> where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he shewed unto them his hands and his side. And that his hands were pierced. His side was also pierced with a spear when they crucified him. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so as you proceed on, Thomas, verse 24, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. So he's one of the 12 disciples. He's one of the 12 apostles, the apostle Thomas. And the other disciples explained they had seen the Lord. And Thomas said, and that's where you get the, the saying, doubting Thomas. Because he doubted even though the other eyewitnesses had seen the Lord and said that uh, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. And put my finger into the print of the nails. And thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. After eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. It, the, the picture you get is both times the doors are shut in John chapter 20. He is materializing in front of them or he's walking through walls to get in there. Either way, the doors are shut and he appears to them. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. See, he didn't believe he was raised from the dead. So Thomas and the twelve weren't going around preaching the resurrection of Jesus as what people would get saved by in, before he died on the cross. They weren't preaching that. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So they didn't even believe, in, even though the eyewitnesses came to them. And we studied that in the past and told them he had been resurrected. Peter, James, and John did not believe he had been resurrected when I witnesses told them. And Thomas didn't even believe, even though the other 12 apostles or 11 apostles told him. He didn't believe. So Jesus confronts him and says to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. 
And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord, that's one name for Jesus, and my God, that's another name for Jesus. Now, if Jesus was not God, here's the time, Jesus, tell him, that's a blasphemy, Thomas. We're going to stone you because you're calling me God when I'm not God. As many people say, Jesus never said he was God. Well, Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas because Jesus is God. And so what Jesus says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas. So he names him. Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So Jesus never rebuked Thomas because Thomas was telling the truth. Calling him his rightful title, my Lord and my God. Let's go back to, and I'm going to end it fairly soon, but let's go back to John uh, chapter 2. And actually, why don't we, when we go back to John chapter 1. So John chapter 1. And so John the Baptist is going around and you got to distinguish John the Baptist is not John the Apostle. John the Baptist is not John one of the 12. You could say he's an apostle of God. That's true. But he is not one of the 12. So don't get confused between the author of the book of John, who is one of the 12 disciples and apostles, and John the Baptist, that was a prophet of God that was pointing the way in, to God, pointing out that Jesus was the God Messiah and how to get into the kingdom of God. So John the Baptist is out there baptizing in the River Jordan. And the Jews come out from Jerusalem and they send out priests and Levites from Jerusalem. So verse 19 of John chapter 1. And this is a record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? They wanted to know, who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And that's Elijah. So ask him, are you Elijah? So they established, okay, you're not Christ. You're not the Messiah. Then who are you? Are you Elijah, basically? And he says, no. He saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? That prophet was the one that everybody needs to listen to. And if that Moses prophecy will come, and if you don't listen to that prophet, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And that's a prophecy of the prophet that would come. It's another name for Christ. He was that prophet that Moses predicted would come. Art thou that prophet? Now, John the Baptist was a prophet, but was he that prophet predicted by Moses? No. And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou that we may give answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And that's prophesied in the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But watch this. And they, and now we're getting into the baptism. Why is there baptism going on? What's going on with this thing? The, the Jews understood baptism. They had baptismal pools outside of the temple. It's an Old Testament thing. It's associated with the Jews. They fully understood. Well, they, they didn't understand some of the implications of Christ, depending on whether they were believers or not. But watch this. And they which were sent of the Pharisees, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? So they're wondering, you're none of those things. Why are you baptizing? In other words, all those three people, the Christ, the Elijah, and the prophet are associated with water baptism. The Jews understood that. And they said, if you're none of these three, why are you baptizing then? If you're none of those three, what are you doing baptizing? And uh, John went on to explain, actually, 
exactly why he was baptizing. He explained that there was a reason for baptism. And uh, look at verse 19. Let's go back to verse. Uh, uh, actually, I think we cover that. Let's go to verse 23. Uh, and 24, we cover that. And they say, why are you baptizing if you're not that? Go down to verse 31. We already covered that. And so here's why John explains he's baptizing. And I knew him not, referring to Christ, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. The, so that Christ would be made manifest to Israel is why John the Baptist was baptizing with water. And he was sent to baptize. That's what the Bible says of him. For I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So he that sent John to baptize with water was God. This is a man that was clearly sent to baptize with water. For what purpose? To manifest Christ to Israel. And under the gospel of the kingdom, water baptism was a prerequisite to the salvation message. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. As you read in Mark 16, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And then you see here, they're doing the baptism of repentance uh, for the remission of sins. And we read that through the Gospels. But this man, and it's to ma manifest Christ to Israel, this man was sent to baptize. Notice those words. I'm going to show you a man that is your apostle, preacher, teacher, and minister of Jesus Christ to you. And we're going to end it on this note that unlike John the Baptist, the one that was sent to you with your salvation message that we get saved by today by grace through faith without works without water baptism and without the mosaic law or any religious ritual by grace through faith in the finished work of christ on the cross that he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead and believing that and that alone saves you for free but i'm going to show you the one given that message by revelation of god let's see if he's like john the baptist who was sent to baptize according to what we read in the book of John, chapter 1. Was Paul sent to baptize? Let's take a look at this. Now, Paul never has water baptism in his salvation message, although he did water baptize at the beginning of his ministry. At some point, Christ revealed to him that he is not being sent to baptize. And let's read it for ourselves. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. For Christ sent me not to baptize. That's completely the opposite of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, we read in John chapter 1, was sent to baptize. As were the 12, they were all sent to baptize. But this Paul is not one of the 12. And Paul was not sent to baptize. Christ sent me not to baptize. But he was to do something other than water baptism. And you'll see water baptism associated with Israel, salvation of the gospel of the kingdom, manifesting Christ to Israel. But then Paul, when he sent to all the nations and all the Gentiles and everybody, the water baptism goes away. You know, there's, they're not manifesting Christ to Israel anymore. They're saving people without the water. God is saving people without the water. and. Instead of being sent to baptize, which expressly he was not, he was sent to do this. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, ah, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Instead of water baptism, which he was not sent to do, he was sent to preach the cross of Christ. And not with wisdom or words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross 
is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That preaching of the cross, a Christ died on the cross for our sins, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day, 1 Corinthians 15. That preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And that is what Paul was sent to do and what you are sent to do, not to water baptize. You're not sent to water baptize. If he wasn't, you, you certainly are not. But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made in none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. How did they get saved? Go down in that same chapter. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Foolish according to those that perish. Foolish according to the world. They think it's a foolish thing. Somebody dying on a cross. Hitler hated the cross. He hated the cross of Christ. He thought it was weak. It was defeatist. And he wanted Christ to be replaced with him. He wanted the Bible to be replaced with Mein Kampf. And that's what atheists, socialists, and Darwinians want to do. They want to eliminate the Bible, and they want to eliminate Christ. And the preaching of the cross is foolish to them because they're perishing. But here we read, it pleased God by the foolishness in the eyes of the world of preaching to save them that believe, not water baptize, not keep commandments, not keep sacraments, now, none of those things are mentioned here. They are saved to save them that simply believe the preaching of the cross. That's what the preaching of the cross does. It saves them that believe. All right, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Uh, God bless you. And I hope you have a blessed week. And I hope you meditate upon these things like I've been meditating upon the book of John tonight, and all of us have. So God bless you, and thank you for attending tonight.